we'd like to welcome Virgil Belford from Great Bend, Kansas. And Virgil is going to share with us his story of World War II, the Great Bend Air Base, and the B-29 bomber. Welcome, Virgil. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. This is kind of unusual and kind of different. I suppose my story starts back in May 1940, which is quite a few years ago when I graduated from Vider High School. Vider High School is about six miles outside of Beaumont, Texas. Uh, not very far from the Louisiana line, not very far from the Gulf of Mexico. There were 40 in our graduating class in the year 1940. Went to work in a bakery at night, of all things, slicing bread and wrapping it. Loaded it into a truck and hauled it to the three stores there in Beaumont. Had to go to work at 11 o'clock at night until 7 or 8 in the morning. We just played havoc with my nightlife in that area. Uh, I'm 19 years old at this time. And Pearl Harbor occurred while I was working one night. Uh, December 1941, if I'm correct on that. Friends of ours got together and decided after considerable time had gone by that we should best be enlisting into the Air Force or enlisting into the Army so as not to be drafted because at that time drafters were, uh, they were the naughty boys, they weren't the good ones. Much better if you enlisted yourself. And one of my friends had a brother that was in the service already and was encouraging us to become officers rather than enlisted men. Well, three of us got together and decided we wanted to get into the Air Force, fly airplanes, here we come. We left uh, November 1942, the three of us went in together. Got separated immediately, which is what usually happens. I was sent to Biloxi, Mississippi for uh, basic training, the normal thing. Uh, and in that period in Biloxi, Mississippi, they gave me all kinds of tests and I uh, had been reminding them that I came into the Air Force to fly airplanes. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. They soon reminded me that I was colorblind and I would not qualify for a pilot at all. But since you're already enlisted and already here, we have other jobs for you. It's just a normal thing that they would pull. I had studied back at Lamar College and saw advertised a class in Morse code free uh, a few months before entering the service and had gone to three of those classes and had learned just a little bit of Morse code. They found this out somehow. Off to radio school, I was sent to Scottfield, Illinois, after we had completed basic training. Did a stint at Scottfield, Illinois, went through the radio school, radio maintenance, and uh, learning the Morse code even more so now, it was steady all day long classes in it. The maintenance consisted merely of removing, uh, not chips, but removing sections of a radio or a transmitter and just slapping in a replacement for the entire section. They taught you how to locate which section it was, but didn't teach you how to repair the particular section, you just replaced it. That was typical military repair service. Uh, from Scottfield, Illinois, for some reason or other, I was sent to Boca Raton, Florida. Why I was picked for that, I have no idea, but that was a radar school. More of the same, we learned to operate the radar. Operate radar was going to be on airplanes and operate the maintenance of the radar. All highly secretive at this time. The radar that was installed on the airplanes is no different than what you could find today at Kmart and put on the dashboard of your car. The very same principle, operates the same, maybe a little different in strength or a different directive, but that's all it amounted to. But at that time it was highly secretive, very secretive. When finishing with Boca Raton, Florida uh, schooling, I was sent to Great Bend, Kansas. All the way across that plains, didn't see a mountain anywhere. Uh, and arrived in November, about November 1943. Stepped off of that train, and it's crunchy stuff under my feet that this Texan had only seen snow once in his lifetime, and here this stuff, I was waiting in it. Quite a change, quite a change in culture, quite a change in the, what I was expecting around here. Spent time here at Great Bend flying uh, practice missions, practice bombing missions, practice uh, uh, shooting missions of various sorts, never actually shooting anything or bombing anything, but uh, general practice missions. The state of Kansas was a dry state at that time, completely dry. When you were lucky enough to get a cross-country flight, which uh, had several of them, uh, you were expected to bring back the Bombay full of alcoholic beverages of some sort. Uh, it was just a pretty known fact that if you went on a cross-country flight, that you brought things back in. Now, this was quite popular in those years. A lot more drinking went on then, I think, than did now, at least among the military, as far as I could tell. Great Bend was sitting out here about five miles from town. They had bus service running back and forth. 
Uh, the USO was located at, uh, do you remember, uh, Forest and we looked that up the other day. Right across from the Great Bend Public across Library. From, across from what's presently the library, across the street from that, across the street east, uh, is where the USO used to be there. Uh, pretty popular, it's been quite a bit of time there. Uh, they held dances frequently at the city auditorium, same city auditorium that sits there today. Uh, that's over 50 years ago, and uh, so that auditorium is getting pretty old. It's no wonder that recently they've had to come up with some repairs on it. But it was at these dances that I met, <coughs> met the girl that I later, later turned out to marry. I was here at uh, Great, the Great Bend Air Base. Uh, they ran bus service, but the bus service quit at 11 o'clock at night. If you fooled around too long, you had to walk it. And uh, I had to walk it several times in order to get back to the base at all, uh, or pay for a taxi, which was too expensive to handle at that time. From uh, Great Bend, I remember, I left on February the 29th. It had to be 1944, and was sent to Karagapur, India. Uh, I don't remember the various stops that we made along the way, but uh, when we left, we really did not know where we were going, except that we were going overseas, and we were taking uh, B-29s with us. That was part of our job, was to get them flown over there. Now, you, you were one of the early crews to come out of Great Bend and be assigned. Well, I, I claim that we were the first crew that, that left Great Bend to go overseas. Uh, <clears throat> there were others here, of course, but I think we were the first ones that flew out of here uh, to go on to a direct mission that was assigned. Can I ask you some questions before we, yes. we go into the missions? Those radios that you used, were those vacuum tube radios? Yes, those were vacuum tube radios. They didn't have such things as uh, the uh, transistor type and the... Uh, didn't have the computers that they have nowadays, but uh, they all had to have power supplies with them. It was common for a power supply to burn out, that you don't need power supplies as much as you do nowadays. Then they were big, heavy radios oh, yeah. compared yeah. To, to what's yeah. used now. Yes, quite a bit, quite a bit more so. Now on the, the radar, it was very new, very secret at that time, the radar that you trained on. Oh yes, highly, highly, highly secretive. Uh, we weren't even supposed to talk about it with our family. We weren't supposed to write letters to our folks to tell them what we were doing and what kind of equipment we might be working on. Uh, nobody was allowed out on the flight line to see it. Uh, you didn't see it unless you were one of the personnel actually working with it. And there were guards around those aircraft. Oh yeah, there constantly. To make sure that no one looked. And yep. Now this this aircraft is the B-29 bomber. Can yes, you tell us a little bit about it? Oh, I don't remember all the me measurements. Uh, the seems to me it was 141 feet uh, wingtip, 160 feet or something of that sort in length. Uh, it was four engines. Uh, I know uh, before every flight, before taking off, one of the checkpoints was to drain a small amount of gasoline out of the bottom of each one of the tanks to be sure that you didn't have water in there. Or whatever water accumulated, it usually sunk to the bottom and you got it drained out of there. That's where we filled up our cigarette lighters uh, and used that fuel for lighters in our cigarette lighters. Uh -huh. uh, worked real good, too. But that was one of the checkpoints. Now, this was a 12-man crew. They had 12 men on, yes, it was 12 men on our crew. Uh, and you guys trained together. You, you met these fellows when you got to Great Bend, is that? I didn't meet any of them until we got to Great Bend. Uh, I was flying in the lead plane of the squadron. Uh, Major Charles Hansen was the uh, pilot of the plane that I was riding on. And uh, I was the backup radio operator. The plane had a radio operator, but I was second radio operator if one was needed. My primary job was uh, the radar operation. Right. Now you practice bombings, you took off and, did, and bombed, practice bombed over Cheyenne Bottoms, is that correct? Yes, I didn't know it was Cheyenne Bottoms, uh, but uh, we had an area that we were supposed to go to. That's up to pilots find those spaces and, and here's where we were, were doing our practicing. We'd do some sighting on the radar equipment and the gunners would do some practicing with uh, some of the, they actually shot some bullets out, but uh, they had tracers on it that you could see where they were going. Uh, there was lead planes that uh, would pull a, a uh, flyer behind it that they practice shooting at. 
And you said that you never met the women that were stationed there. That no, I that didn't meet any bombers. of those. I think I don't know whether they came along after we did, uh, after I left or what. But I just do not recall them. Well, they were all cute, so I'm sure if they'd have been there, you would I have I would noticed. have remembered that. I probably have their name and address written down. <laughs> That's true. Then, what did you practice bomb with? Just. We didn't actually drop any bombs. It was just that we, we used the equipment to guide the pilot over the exact target that we were looking for. Uh, but I don't recall dropping anything at all. Now, you couldn't see out from where you were at? Not from my position, no. I'd had to move somewhere else. Where were you in the aircraft? Yeah. Just about behind the star on the fuselage. If you looked at it uh, from the side, uh, there was a big star on the fuselage uh, back behind the wings of ways. And right behind that star is where I was sitting. It was completely enclosed. There was no windows there. It was a, a complete rack of equipment from top to bottom was in front of me and a normal chair and a seat belt, believe it or not. And you though these were pressurized? Oh, yes, they were aircraft. pressurized. There was a tunnel that you could crawl through uh, from the back end to get up to the pilot's compartment if uh, pilot's bombardier and navigator's compartment if, uh, uh, compartments if necessary. Uh, from there, you could crawl on back to the tail gunner's position. Uh, tail gunner frequently when he was finished with his work would come up and sit down on the floor beside of me. Could you guys talk to each other? Did you have any yeah, communication? Yeah, we had the intercom entirely uh, similar to what you have nowadays that uh, you could punch the button and talk to anybody on the plane. And this was the United States heaviest bomber? At that time, yes. They did come out with a B-52 after that, uh, but I'm not familiar with that. And these were used basically in the Pacific? Yes, they were, were used in the Pacific. Well, uh, yeah, Japan was the Pacific. And so they were not used in Europe? Uh, no, to not to my knowledge. Okay, well, uh, in Great Bend, how did you find the people? Did people here seem friendly and, and very involved in the war effort? Or? Oh, yes, very friendly. Uh, if you were walking uh, in, in heading into town or going back out to the Arab base, usually you rarely had to walk the entire distance. Somebody stopped to pick you up. Some farmer would it was top of the truck or something of this nature, and uh, you'd usually catch a ride, unless it was 2 o'clock in the morning. Then your chances were a little less. When you missed that 11 o'clock bus. Oh, right. Is there anything else about Great Bend that, that you remember, that or the base? Uh, no, it's all gone now, except for one or two of the hangars. Uh, there was just an awful lot of buildings. It's difficult to remember. Uh, I do remember we had uh, I started to say wood burning stoves, but there was coal. It was coal that was being used in the barracks for heating purposes. Didn't have forced air heating like you would have in your homes nowadays. Uh, the people were extremely uh, polite and, and uh, uh, very friendly. Uh, there were, at that time, were two theaters in town. One of them was called The Strand, and I can't remember the name of the other one, but it was on Main Street, right along about where Lewis Jewelry now is. Uh, both of those have since been closed, of course, and what is now the Crest Theater has been built since that time. Uh, these were popular places to go because it was about all there was in Great Bend. That in USO, I guess. That in USO, and USO was popular. There was, it was quite active. There was quite a few people there and a lot of things going on. So that all that's really left out there are the two hangars and those long runways. Yeah, well, that's been a benefit to Great Bend, though. Right. Well, you were sent, you were assigned to a base in India, you and the, and the crew. Karagapur, India, uh, is where we were sent, from what I recall. Uh, that's not too far from Calcutta, India. But the purpose of being there was, I guess, a staging area, was to bring us together. All the planes came together there, and then they took their turns of flying over the hump, over the mountains between there and China, uh, refueling, resting. Uh, getting bombs unloaded on it at China and then fly a mission into Japan or wherever else that they might be sent. Uh, I went across those mountains four times, had four trips that I went on. Uh, I'd never seen mountains before. Kansas don't have mountains. Uh, I come from southeast Texas and was in Texas and Mississippi and Illinois, Florida and into Kansas and there's no mountains there. So to see mountains and flying over them was something of quite a thrill just was in awe about it for, as far as I was concerned. How I many of the other fellows had, had been in these places and had seen them, but it was quite an experience to me. Uh, I understand that it's quite dangerous. Those mountains are quite dangerous that they can be crossed uh, by horseback. And uh, uh, at that time, it was 
told me it's nothing but horseback that would go across there, but it's still quite dangerous, a long, tedious uh, move to get across there. We would fly from India uh, to China, to Qingtu, China, uh, where we were, were based there, would spend overnight, refuel, do whatever repairs was necessary, and go from there to a mission over Japan or whatever. And you said those runways were all hand-built? Yeah, they'd been hand-built by, uh, they call them coolies, by the Chinese. Uh, and what little contact I had with them, they were very friendly. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later when I get back from these missions. Uh, one of the missions was to Sumatra steel mills, and steel shows up beautifully on a radar. So I had the opportunity to see these things real well. The other three were in the uh, Japan area, and they were steel mills that we were after there, either steel mills or bridges. Uh, they were located on a stream of water. A stream of water does not reflect the radar, uh, like a steel mill well. So you could just, you had a picture, literally had a picture in front of you of what you were shooting at. And it was a matter of guiding the pilot until you had it exactly over that spot and got you the button to drop in the bombs. Uh, I was on four missions and on the last one, uh, I don't, never knew whether we had any aircraft fire at us or, or uh, fighters around us. At least I wasn't told about it if we were, or maybe they were and we didn't realize it. But we got all the way back and the pilot had uh, undertaken a landing or shot a, shot a landing and he overshot it, pulled it back up to go around again, which is standard procedure, and didn't make it around. Uh, we crashed before he got back around again. Uh, the crash itself, if you've ever been in an automobile crash, magnified considerably, uh, greatly. It's real loud, uh, a lot of crunching metal and steel, and it's just a horrible sound, but it doesn't last very long. Uh, there were some fires. I could see a fire or two off in the distance from me, but uh, it wasn't anywhere near me. There was very little burning, but there was some. Uh, the plane cracked up, broke up, scattered over a, a large area. Uh, I later told that we were in a rice paddy, uh, because that was their crop that they grew there. Uh, I did not ever see any of the crew men again after that. They were all killed apparently instantly. I didn't hear anybody speak or call out help or anything of that nature. I heard nothing. Uh, this became quiet uh, after the crash. Uh, I realized that the right, my right side and right leg had an injury and took a look down it and I could see two bones sticking up like this crossed. Uh, and I thought I should straighten that out and decided that wasn't very smart either, particularly when uh, you got the severe pain involved in it. Uh, I had uh, cuts and bruises in various places. Later found out I had a cracked ankle and a cracked hip. Uh, had a cut right above an eyebrow up here that kept letting blood come down in my face and I'm constantly wiping at it and discovered that there was a cut on my wrist that was feeding it also. Putting just more on there, wasn't getting it wiped off. Uh, those things just come to mind. Uh, later in the evening, it hadn't been too long, I can't tell how long because I was passing out and, and regaining consciousness that there were Chinese that came around and uh, of course couldn't understand anything they said, but they were friendly. They built a fire, spent the night with me there. Uh, it was not real cold, I'd say, you know, 45, 50 degrees, not, uh, not real uncomfortable, but cool. Uh, they spent the night jabbering all the time, but I couldn't understand a word they were saying, but uh, they gave me uh, things to drink, and it was hot. I couldn't figure out why I was getting hot water. I later found out that this was hot tea that they were uh, giving me. And they spent the night with me. Uh, it happened about 11 o'clock at night, the uh, rescue teams didn't get out there until about 7 o'clock the next morning. They had to carry me almost a mile to a highway or to a, to a road where they could have an ambulance to put me into. Uh, right lower leg was torn up badly. Uh, a lot of muscle and blood vessels were badly torn up. Lost uh, chunks of the bone, two or three inches of it uh, in the shin bone area. Uh, they attempted to put that back together. Well, what little they could do with it. They don't do it today like they did then. Uh, today is much more modern with it. But they at least got it straightened, halfway straightened, and uh, got things sewed up, got blood loss, stopped, and spent several days, I don't remember, several days or a week or so, uh, there at Qingtu, China. While I was there, I remember one night that uh, they got me loaded on a stretcher and uh, some of the uh, orderlies there carried me downstairs outside to the theater that they had to see a show that was being put on by Jinx Falkenberg and uh, Pat O'Brien, who were popular 
movie actors at that time. Uh, they were there on a USO visit to people there in the hospital and in that area. Uh, I have some pictures of, uh, of Jinx Falkenberg and the other lady that was with her, but I, I cannot remember who she was. I was there long enough to get in on that part. Uh, I was then transferred to Calcutta, India, where the military had a larger uh, hospital. I got there, I really didn't have any surgery or any further treatment other than just care of it. A uh, permanent, more permanent cast was put on, given my first set of crutches. I was told to get up and walk, which I did, although this leg was pretty well torn up. I still have the same set of crutches that was issued to me in Calcutta, India. I've loaned them out to several people here in this area. I just got them back the other day, a few days ago. I have to think about that. Uh, I stayed there until, see this happened in August 44, and it was March 45 that I was still in Calcutta before I finally got sent back to the United States. There was, this was about the time that there was a heavy push going on in the European theater when the invasion of Germany and, and France and so forth was going on. And they had so many casualties and uh, their transport crews were so busy and loaded that they decided I was low priority in comparison to the others and they were sending them home first, uh, which I guess was all right, but I was beginning to complain about having to sit around and uh, them not doing anything. You met some other fellows there. Oh, yes. Uh, you, meet, you meet a lot of people. Uh, I had an opportunity to go visiting downtown in Calcutta, which was, uh, to me, was an extremely dirty town. Uh, had a smell in it that you don't forget. Uh, it was just, just dirty and uh, a bad smell about it. Uh, other fellows uh, in the hospital there, uh, I have some pictures of this, and, uh, but didn't correspond with them, didn't stay in touch with them after we left there. But uh, there was people there with broken necks and broken legs and backs and uh, just all kinds of miscellaneous injuries. I consider myself, myself quite fortunate. Uh, out of the 12 men on board, 11 of them get killed, and uh, I'm salvaged, and uh, to this day I don't know why, but I suppose the good Lord does, and I'm not going to question that any further. Uh, one out of 12 to survive is, seems rather, rather unusual. Uh, spent some time in Calcutta. See, I was there over Christmas, and that, that was very depressing to be in an area like that at Christmas time. March 1945, uh, early, early March, finally got out of there. Uh, the route back, I remember we stopped in Egypt, it was one of the stops, and I don't remember the rest of them, but uh, we weren't there very long with that same set of crutches stayed with me, although they carried me on a stretcher, and I could have done some walking, I still had that same set of crutches I was able to keep. Uh, come back to uh, Florida, where we first stopped, and uh, they were, we were met with a truck that had milk, ice cream, orange juice, uh, all of the fresh stuff that you didn't get overseas was there for the asking, uh, that it was just being handed to you immediately when you landed. Uh, spent just two or three days there before I was moved from there to uh, uh, Temple, Texas, hospital in Temple, Texas. Uh, went through some surgeries, surgeries in that area, some skin grafts that they attempted. Uh, and let's see, in 45, yes, in 45 is when I married the girl that I mentioned earlier in the, uh, I was talking back there about the dances, that that's where I met that girl. Her name was Lorraine Crampy, and uh, we were married. Uh, well, I was still in the service and had two children before I finally got out of the service. I remember we were stationed, when we were stationed in Temple, Texas, well, uh, I could stay in the hospital or I could uh, uh, go into an apartment where we tried to stay in town. Uh, we had an apartment that was an attic apartment. Around here we got basement apartments. This was an attic apartment. The uh, eaves and the roof came right down across the bed uh, to where there was probably be two and a half, three foot clearance uh, in this little apartment that we were into. Uh, was moved from there back to uh, William Beaumont General Hospital in El Paso, Texas, and they uh, attempted some, about three different bone grafts and some additional skin grafts. Still never did get that leg to stop draining. Uh, I went on numerous 30 and 60 day, would be 60 and 90 day furloughs. Uh, usually came back to Kansas, uh, where my wife's folks were. I would spend the time there. Uh, took it upon myself to 
build a stand underneath the arch of uh, my right foot and attached it to that cast and I began walking on it even though it was painful and it would pound those two ends of that bone together. After about 60 days of this, I went back and they x-rayed it again and discovered that it had rode together about three quarters of an inch, something I had never done before. And they couldn't understand what I had done that might cause that. And it was stimulation. The stimulation increased the blood supply in that area uh, that finally caused, caused that to grow back together again. Uh, well, that made it kind of late. And then they put on me what is known as a walking cast. It had a steel piece that came down uh, the sides of the leg and underneath the foot. And uh, it put kind of a rubber tire apparatus on it to uh, be able to walk on it. And uh, Tony Combe walks more. Kept it up for three or four times, and uh, it finally grew together where they considered it to be strong enough to uh, get a cast off and put a brace on it. But it didn't heal up. Uh, it still drained. There was infection in there, infection on the bottom side of that uh, shin bone, we'll call it, that discontinued. And it continued for many, many years. I wore a two by two. Uh, bandage patch on that uh, constantly until uh, long about 1980 the right knee began bothering me so much uh, they put this together crooked it wasn't straight and had worn out the cartilage between the joints where the two ends of the bone were banging against each other and I just wasn't hardly walking at all and I went to a doctor in Wichita an orthopedic doctor in Wichita about it and uh, yes we can fix that but we're not going to touch it until we get that infection stopped. Uh, went back into the Wichita hospitals and they went in and carved out portions of that bone like you'd cut a rotten part out of an apple to where they got it back to good, solid, clean bone and it healed up. Uh, they had to do two or three skin grafts on top of that before they got the opening closed and it hasn't drained since then. It stayed that way. Uh, 1987, I had a total knee replacement it fixed the knee joint, and uh, they're along great with it now. The rest of the body can't keep up with that knee. But it's a horrible scar. Right? Oh, yes, it's a bad scar, but then uh, I'm not in any beauty contest that, uh, that bothers that scar. It's numbness. There's not an awful lot of feeling in there, but it's not painful. Did you ever get discouraged that if it was ever going to heal? Oh, yes, there was times in, uh, when I was in El Paso that uh, I'd been there so long. See, I came back in... Uh, March, uh, hmm, lost 40, my train of thought. March 1945? 45, and uh, I didn't get out until 48, so it was about three years that I was back and forth on those hospitals. Uh, and that, I got very discouraged about that. I asked them to take it off. I asked them to go ahead and remove the lower leg, and uh, uh, they didn't do it. Fortunately, they didn't, because uh, it finally got itself grown back together again. Well, to this day, it's getting along pretty good. Uh, the rest of the body just don't quite keep up with it now. I understand. Then you were given a disability discharge when you were discharged? Oh, yes. <clears throat> yes, I was considered 55%. Uh, I forgot the percentage. You know how there was, they ranked it as a percentage of disability uh, that they would rate you as, and that had to do with what your, your disability pension might be. Can we go back uh, for just a minute on the missions that you flew? You flew out of India, over the Himalayas, and into Chengdu. Did you know your destination before you left India, or were you given those when you got to China? No, not really. Uh, we just knew that we were going on a mission. Where, where else was it to go? We were down in that area of Japan. Of course, everybody surmised that. That was Chengdu, T-U, uh, was the way we pronounced it. But uh, we really didn't know. We didn't know when we left the United States where we were going other than it was India, that's all. Uh, we didn't know Karagapur, we didn't know what kind of base it would be, we really didn't know what we were supposed to be doing other than we would be with these B-29 planes. And then, when you guys came in over a target and there was cloud cover, then it was your job to sight the target and drop, drop uh, that's, the... That's right, that's what the radar was for. Uh, we had a bombardier and a navigator, but the bombardier was supposed to uh, guide the plane to the point that he could drop the, uh, drop the bombs in the right spot. Uh, of course, you got cloud cover to, to contend with. If it wasn't the clear day, well, he couldn't do that. And I was following it exactly along at the same time. Uh, I could tell where it was. If he couldn't, then I took over and guided the pilot to that. Uh, I, fortunate, shall I say, I uh, dropped out of those four missions, I dropped the bombs three times. Uh, 
that it was my duty to do that. You could see a thing, but you're sitting there with a little screen about, uh, oh, about six inches round that would show you exactly what, what you were looking at. Then did he use a Norden bomb site? Yes, it was a Norden bomb site. You've heard that name then. As long as he could see, though. Yeah. Otherwise, it was up to you. But when he couldn't see, well, there was just one thing. This, this way, they could bomb from such high altitude. Now, in the, the bombing before that, they had to do a lot of blow out to, to get down below clouds. And how, how high did you guys fly? Only in the 30,000 foot range. And you dropped bombs from that range? Yes, yes. Then did you have problems with fighter, uh, Japanese fighter aircraft? Not that I can recall. Now, there could have been some around. There could have been some that uh, we might have gotten shot or hit by some uh, any aircraft fire that might have ruptured a gas tank. I'm not, I don't know that because everybody else got killed. I don't know what the circumstances were. I don't know what was. happened. No, I had instruments in front of me. I had an airspeed indicator and uh, uh, an altimeter and some other instruments necessary to calculate your bomb with the wind speed, that, uh, the winds that they may have down below. But uh, I didn't have anything else. And I know when we went down, I thought it rather strange that the altitude was going down and the airspeed going up. And I looked up and saw that and thought, something's not going right. We hit. But you didn't hear anything? You didn't hear any conversations? No, no comment any? on the intercom, and I had earphones on, but there was no comment on the intercom by anybody that uh, there was any problems. I think he was just too low that suddenly he lost, he lost an engine or several engines, and uh, altitude just dropped immediately. He didn't have a chance to make any recovery. But no one said anything about getting hit with anti-aircraft fire? No, nobody anything? said anything. I've just surmised that uh, this is the possibility. Something went wrong. Yeah. I could have caused some loss, loss of fuel. Your base in India, what was it like? Was it um, fairly nice or? No. Pretty uh, Well, nice, uh, that's hard to compare. Uh, it was adequate, let's put it that way. There was no air conditioning, of course, and uh, none of the niceties that, that you have nowadays. Uh, we were cautioned not to frequent uh, local pubs and uh, local areas like that because they had not been cleared for cleanliness that you always run into a problem of a possible disease and this sort of thing. Uh, so we pretty well stayed away from that. We pretty well stayed within unless we went into the larger towns. And then we'd be given a list of places that had been approved as far as cleanliness was concerned. Right, you, eating the food and... Yeah, yeah. Then, have you ever had any contact with the other crew members' families? since the accident? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I was in Beaumont, Texas at one time, and there were three of them. But I can't remember the name, but there were three of them that came and talked to me, and, and about all I could tell them was of uh, my life with them for the few weeks or months that we were together. Uh, you know, some of the wisecrack things or jokes or something of this sort that they may have told. Uh, and then I never heard of them anymore. It's probably comforting to them that, that they probably died instantly. Comforting somewhat, yes. Uh, they didn't stay very long. They were just there one day, if I remember right. There was three of them came in. Then, uh, when you were finally discharged and given your disability, what did you do? Did you go to school or go into business? Well, when I left to go into the service, I had, had been working, uh, I mentioned working nights at a bakery. And I had left that and gone to work for a construction company, a dirt construction company. I had a brother-in-law that operated a, a drag line, which is the little thing that throws a bucket out and drops it and picks up a load of dirt and moves it around. And he got me on with that company as an oiler, which would be a helper uh, on a drag line, helper to the operator. And I had been working at that for probably two or three months. Uh, and it was working in a, in a lot of mud, uh, very dirty. And I decided that's something I could not go back to with this leg open and draining it. I didn't want to risk getting into something like that. Although I had just reached the point I was beginning to operate, uh, had learned to operate the drag line. And when he went on his lunch break, well, uh, they gave me an opportunity to get up there and play with the machine. Uh, and that was just a lot of fun. That was a big accomplishment at that time. And I could have followed that profession, I guess. Other than that, I had no profession. I came out of high school and uh, had no intention of going to college. College was something for smart people and for people who had a lot of money. Uh, this was my feeling about it at that time. Uh, so I didn't know what I was going to do. It was just going to be whatever manual labor uh, job that might be able to be picked up. Well, 
came out of the service and uh, still had no uh, real ideas as to what I wanted to do from their own. We well, came up to uh, Kansas numerous times, spent, tried to spend part of the time here and part of the time down there with my parents, and uh, came up here and there was an ad in the paper one day for a bookkeeper by Dick Evans uh, was looking for someone. Uh, I thought I liked bookkeeping in high school and had gotten along well with it, so I applied for the job. I got the job. That led into a little bit of everything. Uh, it led into uh, a future partnership with Dick. Uh, I was in partnership with him for seven years, even after working for him for several years. And uh, I acquired a CPA certificate without a college education, uh, doing some night study and uh, correspondence courses and studies at home. I managed to pass the CPA examination. Uh, in 1963, Dick decided that he was uh, wanting to retire, and I took the biggest part of the business and opened up a business of my own uh, over on 10th Street. I stayed with that until uh, 1987. It branched into a partnership that took on two other partners. And in 1987, I sold out to those two partners and kept just a few of the accounts myself that I took home to give me something to do. And as of now, I do a small amount of accounting work at home. I know, because we couldn't do this interview until after April the 15th. <laughs> well, that's right. I did put you off on that. That's right. Too busy. Uh, busy, but not as busy as I used to be. Uh, I cut it down way, uh, an awful lot. And I could have worked this sort of thing in back there in January, February, and March when I was busy uh, with tax work. But uh, I was trying not to do so much. And then your interest in, in radios has continued. Oh, radios, yes. I had a, a lot of interest in radios in the military. That's where it got started, really. And I learned my Morse code uh, so well. I achieved 30 words per minute uh, receiving and sending Morse code, which is uh, an accomplishment that a lot of fellows have trouble with. I got involved in amateur radio uh, from that standpoint. And to this day, I'm still quite involved with amateur radio. I've got them at home, got them in my car, got some that I can carry around in my pocket. And then you also, the guy who they wouldn't let you be a pilot. You have a pilot's license, don't you? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, back then, at that time, the military wouldn't, uh, wouldn't take you for pilot training if you were colorblind. Now it seems that's not so important, uh, that you can still get licensed for flying airplanes even though you are colorblind. And there's various degrees of colorblindness, too. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but I think that if, uh, if you're going to fly a commercial, that you uh, can't be colorblind and have a pilot's license for that. But I did get what we call a private pilot's license. I took lessons, uh, lessons right here in Great Bend, and I still wanted to fly. And I used to enjoy it quite immensely. I used it in business for a while, but it just wasn't enough to justify the cost of it, and uh, I finally gave it up and dropped that. And then your second wife is Eloise? Second wife is Eloise. was Eloise Goggleman uh, originally. Uh, and we've been married, it'll be 24 years in, in August. First, uh, first marriage went 23 years and ended in a divorce. I had nine children involved, uh, nine children and one stepdaughter, which is Eloise's. Uh, and these children are scattered all over the United States. Uh, got one in Spring, Texas, one in uh, Ohio, one in Chicago, Illinois, one in Nevada, Missouri, one in Wichita, uh, one in Ellenwood, one in Hoisington, one locally. Uh, they're just pretty well scattered, and that also equates into 29 grandchildren. Of that 29, three of them are step-grandchildren, and uh, three, four of them are great-grandchildren now. So Great Bend's been your home? Oh, Great Bend's been my home, yes. I've lived in, I've lived in Kansas longer than I lived in Texas, and uh, I really have no need to go back down there at all. I had one sister, and she passed away about a year ago. Uh, I have uh, a niece and three nephews down there, and that's all the relatives that I have down there on my side of the family. So I really have no need to go back there at all. Uh, it's kind of nice to visit back with Vider High School. We had a uh, reunion on our 50th class reunion, and I think we're going to come up with one for our 55th, which would be next year sometime. But we're getting, the last one I went to, I told my wife that uh, I said, gee, this is no fun. It's nothing but a bunch of old people. That's true. Which included myself, of course. Virgil, uh, something that comes up periodically when we, we do interviews, when we talk to people, is the atomic bomb. Do you have any feelings about 
the really the wisdom of using the atomic weapon against Japan, having flown against them and the tough missions that had to be done. Well, of course, I didn't have anything to do with the atomic bomb. I wasn't around it, and uh, it, it came after my, uh, my activity in it. Uh, I really think it was necessary. It was necessary that uh, we had the power to do that, and I think it was necessary to gain that kind of control. They didn't seem to be listening to anything else. Right. Uh, now, this day, uh, to start dropping atomic bombs now, I think would be a terrible thing to do. Uh, it seems to me that people in general, and I'm speaking about all over the world, uh, at least they understand things a little bit better. They seem like they are more apt to sit down and talk out the problems rather than jumping into uh, active combat. Uh, there's been so many things going on in the world the last few years that uh, 30 or 40 years ago there would have been active combat involved, but they've been working on trying to settle it without having the active combat. Now, these are personal opinions, of course, but uh, I really feel that uh, the world is coming to the point of trying to talk out the problems uh, rather than trying to do it with force. Not send their 19, 20-year-olds to, yes. to fight. Well, Virgil, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Gosh, I, I've talked so much. Uh, I don't know. You know, of course, you go blank when you approach with a question like that. And uh, I don't think so. I think I've about covered it. Well, we appreciate you coming today. Thank you so Thank you. much.